Good morning on this glorious Palm Sunday. We want to invite our friends and family and new friends from the hallway into the worship center as we take a few moments to prepare our heart for worship. And we have a special treat this morning. Our children are going to sing for us, and that will help prepare our hearts to sing. And so uh, through the voices of these beautiful children, we're going to hear some music, some worship songs, and then, uh, and then we'll stand together for the call to worship and sing together. So thank you, kids. We can't wait to hear.
I've just been giving instructions to the parents to pick your kids up in the classroom. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Weston Community Church. I'm Jay Hager. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you, children. That is such a um, sweet performance. It fills my heart with a lot of joy. I'm just beaming over here with a big smile. It's hard not to listen to them. So we appreciate them getting us started off on this Palm Sunday. If you saw, we have palm branches that uh, you can grab outside of the sanctuary and bring in here. We're going to be doing some uh, waving and some dancing um, this morning, so prepare yourselves. Uh, it's really sweet. We had a good time in the first service. I want to welcome you here and um, just invite you now to stand for our call to worship. John Bourgeois reminded me this week, there are no adults in heaven. Um, we are all children of the living God. And so like those children who saying, we come as dependent children upon our Father to meet us and meet our needs this morning. And so he invites us to come and to receive from him in spirit and in truth. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. And together to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Let's pray. Indeed, Father, we thank you that although you are King of kings and Lord of lords, you, are, you, are dwell, you dwell in unapproachable light. You have made yourself known. You have condescended yourself through the, through the person and the work of Jesus to bring your children home. And so, Lord, we come and we rest in Jesus' work and we worship you and do what we were created to do. May you bless us in this and minister to us by the power of your spirit for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together now. See the king. Hosanna in 
Jesus, and we sing together, heal my heart. One God, who is three persons, but one God, holy and beautiful, Trinitarian God. We 
now confess our faith together in and through that God. In this a beautiful old ancient creed, we stand on the promise that is Jesus, the one who is to come. And we confess our faith through this ancient creed, the Apostles' Creed, which millions of Christians across the world, are, world right now are confessing with us. And saints have done this before and they will do it after us. And so we join in the uh, everlasting song by confessing our faith now together to the Apostles' Creed. Let's say this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Amen. Amen. As we begin this holy week, um, these songs usher us into this place where we remember the story and we think of those crowds that gathered and the donkey and this savior riding on a donkey. And then we see how quickly, we know the story and where it's going and how the crowds turn. And we know our own hearts prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And when we worship, we say, take my heart and seal it. That this, this declaration we just sang about, this one Christ, who will accomplish what he set out to accomplish, who, who in fact will finish this week in the most triumphant way. We look ahead to that and we have the vision of this story and even now we are at this in between and we hold to this truth that the love will not let us go. Let's sing this one together with joy this morning. Welcome again to Weston Community Church. We're so glad you're here. If you please be seated. We enter into a time of giving. Now we believe that this is part, this is an act of worship. As we consider all that God has so freely and graciously given us, we respond with our, our gifts so that he can continue the good work of his kingdom and bless this world um, as he's blessed this church and these ministries here. Um, so I want to invite you to just spend a few moments prayerfully considering 
how you might continue to support the work of this church and the work of the other ministries that we support around the globe. Um, you can give using the QR code up on the screen. There are also physical baskets in the sanctuary now um, that are safe and secure, which you can put a physical gift. But um, please take a moment now um, and prayerfully consider how you can continue to support the wonderful work of this church. Would you pray with me? Father, we just bow before you with hearts of gratitude, remembering your grace to us, the ways in which you've provided for all of our needs. We don't deserve it, Lord, and so we worship you and thank you. We ask that you would bless these gifts and use them for the expansion of your kingdom, for your glory, to make Jesus' name famous so that more and more people could come to know this deep and remarkable love that you have to offer a broken world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to invite Pastor John up for our baptism this morning. Great. Thank you, Jay. Uh, it's like we went to the generic pastor store <laughs> and you're the tan version of me. <laughs> Um, good morning. Welcome to West End. I'm John Bourgeois. I'm one of the pastors here. And we get the great joy of having a baptism this morning. just want to say a couple quick words and invite the Thomas family up. Um, we live in an interesting age where uh, people are seeking for identity, right? That's one of the, the main questions that people are asking right now. Who am I and where can I go to achieve an identity? How can I grasp after identity, create an identity, um, give get an identity that's sturdy and I can hold on to. The beauty of the Christian faith is that for 2,000 years, the Christian church has been a people that said, we don't create our identity. We don't achieve our identity. We receive our identity. Our identity as children of God is something that God has purchased for us, that our, our Savior Jesus has given his life for us and sent his spirit to us to make us into children. And then the work of the Christian life is living into the identity that we've been freely given, freely granted. And the sacrament of baptism is where we get to see this picture, that we get to watch this water get put on the head of sweet Jackson and see that this is the work that God does in our lives, that we are recipients of his grace to us. So Jenna and Josh, if you guys want to come up with the kids and want to say a few words to you, and then um, we'll baptize Jackson. And family, if y'all want to come up, do you want family to come up? Y'all come up too, and can stand over here um, behind Jenna and Josh. So um, remind us of what, what we do in baptism. Baptism, uh, we're reminded that our God is a God who saves he doesn't just save individuals, but he saves families, and he is saving a whole people for himself. And his faithfulness is from generation to generation, as we see up here, the generations of God's faithfulness to you as a family. Um, and so uh, we see that demonstrated the baptism on uh, the children of believers. And baptism isn't a signal to God that we believe, but a sign from God that we belong. It demonstrates his saving power and his steadfast love, which is our only hope for our children. So I want to uh, remind you of your duties as Christian parents to Jackson and to Elise that uh, you would teach him, teach to hi, <laughs> teach him the word of God and pray with him and pray for him, that you would show him what it means uh, to know and love and follow Jesus by the way that you love each other and the way that you forgive each other and you um, apologize to one another and the way that you love one another is going to show him um, how it is that Jesus loves him. And I want to read to you these covenant promises. For to you is the promise, and to your children, and to all that are far off, 
even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto himself. And he says, I will establish my covenant between you and your children after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be your God and the God of your children. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved, you and your household. All right, we know that baptism doesn't save Jackson and we pray that the Lord Jesus will be faithful to this baptism and will give him faith at a young age. Give him faith quickly. So um, the Thomases have an interesting birth story for Jackson. I asked their permission to tell the story. They said it's fine because the news covered it when he was born. He was born in the parking garage of the, a hospital. He came quickly. And so our prayer is that his faith would come quickly, that his faith in Jesus would come just as quickly as he came into the world. So, hi. Good morning. Jackson, Lewis, Thomas, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you great praise for this child. Lord, thank you for placing the seal, the sign and seal of your covenant upon him. And we pray that Jackson would never know a day where he doesn't know the affection of you, our Lord Jesus, and the smile of his Father in heaven. Lord, thank you for this family and for your faithfulness to them throughout the generations, that your name is glorified and praised through them. And Lord, we pray this for Jackson, that you would raise him up to be strong and courageous and to love Jesus and to give his life and service for him, that you would receive glory in his life. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I need to invite, I need to do the, the vows. Should. I should do the vows. We need, to, we need to do that. I'll hold you and we'll do this. Um, do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the grace of his son? And do you claim his covenant promises on his behalf and look to faith in Lord Jesus for his salvation as you do for your own? And do you unreservedly dedicate him and promise and humble reliance upon, de- upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before him a godly example that you'll pray with and for him and that you will teach him the doctrines of our holy religion and strive by all means of God's appointment to bring him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And then for us as a congregation, do you um, undertake the responsibility of assisting this family in the Christian nurture of this child? Yes, okay. Please welcome Jackson Lewis Thomas, child of the covenant. Thank you all. Yeah, my watch. Let me be seated. I got it. Um, so I did that out of order. I'm sorry. Um, I think one of the beautiful things about the way the grace of God works, honestly, is that, that our timing is always off. Like, it, the reality of our lives, our timing is always off, and his isn't. So um, I hope that that serves as an illustration to his faithfulness to us, even when, when your, your lead pastor can't get it right on a Sunday morning. Um, I'm John. I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome to Weston Community Church. Um, today is Palm Sunday, as we've heard, and I think there's, there's this deep irony about Palm Sunday. Um, the palms were uh, the symbol of the Maccabean Revolt, which was this war that happened 400 years before Jesus' birth. And the symbol, it was actually on the coin, the Jewish coin, symbolizing this, this waiting, this anticipation of this conquering king that was going to come from the Jewish people, that was going to overthrow Rome. And so when Jesus entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the people gathered the palm branches because they're, they're expecting this triumphant king to ride in on his war horse. And how did Jesus come? He came on a donkey. And this reality that our Lord Jesus comes to us humble and a servant, and we come expectant for this king. Who is this king? Who will return in victory, but he first came on the donkey. And that's what we celebrate together on Palm Sunday. Um, We are uh, in a sermon series right now studying the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed, as Brett reminded us, is this ancient creed of the church, this, this, this series of these bold affirmations that the church has said for generations, for 1,000 years, 1,500 years, claiming this is what we believe to be true about what the Bible says about who God is. And as we've been walking through the Apostles' Creed together, this morning we arrive at this bold affirmation that we believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. So what do you do when you're sorry? 
When you feel sorry, um, when you know that there's something wrong, what do you do when you're sorry? In 2005, the soap company Method Soap released an online marketing campaign. It was a website called comeclean.com. And um, it, you, you went to this website, and it was a picture of like a, a bathroom sink that had the faucets on. There's running water, and there's two palms on the screen, which are to be your hands. And the right side of the screen, there's a little text box that reads, Enter your confession. Start the new year fresh by coming clean. So you type in your confession, and you hit enter, and, um, and then uh, what you write appears on the left palm, and then the hands go up, and they pump the soap, the method soap, and the hands wash, and there's sparkles, and then your hands are clean. It says your hands are now clean, right? Brilliant marketing. Method has the power to wash your sins away. But there was a problem, and the problem was that people started confessing things that method soap didn't know what to do with. People confessed theft, and people confessed adultery, and people confessed murder. And so Method took the website down, because <laughs> when they started realizing, receiving these confessions of really bad stuff, they, they realized, we, we can't tell people they're forgiven of this stuff. Like, we, we're a soap company, we don't have that power and authority, right? <laughs> so this gets at this, this, really this fundamental human question, what do we do when we're sorry? What do we do when we know we need to be forgiven? What do we do? Well, as we talk about the forgiveness of sins together this morning, we're going to spend some time reflecting on um, the Thursday night of Holy Week um, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And we're going to do this from Matthew chapter 26, and that's printed on the, the back of your bulletins. It's also inside your bulletins, also on the screen. I want to invite you now to stand for the reading of God's Word this is God's word for us this morning. It is trustworthy, and it's true, and he gives it to us in love. This is Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Um, so two weeks ago, I had, uh, went on a spring break mission trip with our children's school, and I had the privilege of, um, of preaching at a, a rural church outside of Santa Domingo uh, in the Dominican Republic, and um, the elder who was leading the service, uh, I, I don't speak Spanish. There was a translator. Um, it was wonderful. But the elder who was leading the service gave this great illustration. I want to show it to you. This, when we pray after, when we pray before the sermon, we, we quiet our hearts, we invite God to speak. He used this illustration that really helped me to understand this. Um, he said, when you take a, a, a bottle of water, there's, there's water in the bottle, and if, let's say you're standing outside and it's raining, and there's rain in the clouds, and the bottle is like our hearts, and the water is like the Holy Spirit. And so in order for the, the rainwater to enter into the bottle, we have to take the top off the top of the bottle. Simple. That's what we're doing when we, as we're about to pray, when we invite the Spirit to speak to us by His Word, we're just taking the top off the, bottles, off the, top off the bottle of our heart and inviting the Spirit to do this work, to work with His Word to speak to us. So let's, um, let's do that now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, um, thank you that you're with us by your Spirit. Lord, thank you that you reign over your church in love and you delight to speak to your children and call them home through your word. And so, Lord, we ask now, would you do just that? I invite you to take a moment now to, take, to screw off the top of your hearts and to invite the Spirit um, to speak to you this morning. And would you pray for those who are sitting around you? And would you pray for me? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So I um, have two points this morning, simple outline. First, the gift of forgiveness, and then second, our response to that gift. So the gift of forgiveness, and then our response to that gift. So this is what Jesus is picturing for us in the Lord's Supper. He's, he's picturing for us the forgiveness of sins. And in this, right, he gives us these, these two really tangible elements. He gives us bread, and he gives us the cup. So first, we're going we're gonna to look at the bread. The bread in the supper tells us about the significance of Jesus' death. 
And to see this, we need to zoom out to under, in order to understand the, the backdrop of this meal that Jesus is eating with his disciples. Right before what we read in this passage in Matthew 26, in verse 19, we learn that Jesus and his disciples are celebrating a very special meal here. They're celebrating the Passover supper. Now, some of you know about the Passover because you're Jewish. Some of you um, know about a Seder because you've been invited by a Jewish friend to, to celebrate the Seder. Uh, meal. But for those of you who are unfamiliar with this meal, the Passover meal was an annual feast. It is an annual feast that was started in ancient Israel about 3,400 years ago. And this meal was given by God to ancient Israel to recount and to celebrate Israel's deliverance from slavery in Egypt. And it was created to be a perpetual meal, a meal that is celebrated every year. In Exodus 12, 14, it says, This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it. You should repeat it. You'll keep it as a feast to the Lord. And verse 26 tells us that Jesus, he's the host. He's the presider over this meal. He breaks the, bl- the bread, and he blesses it. And typically, the host would say something like this. They'd say, This is the bread of affliction, which our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. Meaning, as we eat this bread we remember the suffering of our ancestors, the suffering that they had as they were in slavery in Egypt. And we eat, they would eat unleavened bread, bread without yeast in it, to remind them that they left Egypt in such a haste, such a hurry, that there wasn't time for the bread to rise. They suffered so that we can be delivered, so that the people of Israel could be delivered. Now, Jesus, he blessed the bread according to tradition, He broke the bread and he distributed it to the people at the meal, just as any Passover host would. But then he deviated from the formula. He did something new. 1,400 years of this meal being celebrated in every Jewish household annually, the exact same way, and then Jesus did something new. What did he say? He said, holding the bread, this is my body. In other words, he said, this is the bread of my affliction my suffering. What is he doing? He's saying to his disciples, this meal that our people have celebrated for 1,400 years is actually about me. Jesus is saying, I'm the fulfillment of this meal. I'm going to suffer so that you can be delivered. Imagine with me the disciples' response. Maybe some of their jaws dropped. Maybe some leaned forward, skeptical, or leaned back with with, um, surprise and incredulity. Like, Jesus is taking the most important event in the history of God's people and saying 1,400 years later, it's actually about him. It's difficult for us to overestimate the weight of this. The Exodus defined God's people, defined them, it told them who they were as the beloved of God that he was willing to save out of slavery and make him his own. The Jews always look to the Exodus as proof of God's love and proof as their place as his chosen people. But here in this meal, Jesus is saying there's even an even greater event, an even greater Exodus coming, an even greater liberation. The first Passover was eaten the night before the people were freed from their slavery in Egypt. And this Passover is the night before another liberation. Not freedom from slavery in Egypt, but freedom from slavery to sin and death. Listen, we can't miss this. Jesus is making an incredible statement here. He's saying that his death is now the definitive event in world history. His death is proof of God's love. His death will be the ultimate means of liberation. His death will be the way to victory. He's saying there is nothing bigger, there's nothing more central, nothing more important to your life, nothing more important to your health, your happiness, your sense of self, nothing more important than the death of Jesus. It's the most important thing that has ever happened. His death isn't just one truth among many. It's not one way to get to God. It's the truth, the main event, the definitive event in world history. And here's why this matters. Every religion, every philosophy tells us that what we do is the most important thing about us. What you do is the most important thing about you, but not the Christian faith. The Bible tells us that it's what Jesus has done what is most important. God is the Savior. He's the liberator. He's the one who can can free you from your slavery to sin. He's the one who can rescue you from death, who can give you real life, who can give you abundant life, the forgiveness of sin, salvation, eternal rest. These don't come to you through what you've done. 
what you can do from, for God, but what God has done for you in Jesus. So when Jesus says, this is my body, he's saying to you, this is the bread of my affliction. He's saying, my suffering is for you. I suffered for your sin so that you don't have to. And while the bread tells us about the significance of Jesus' death, the cup tells us about what his death accomplished. Verses 27 to 28 says, Jesus took the cup, and after he given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And for those of us who find ourselves in church on a regular basis, I think we miss the strangeness of this. Jesus takes a cup, he tells his friends to drink it, and then he tells them that it has his blood in it. Like, it's not a cruel party trick. He's not saying, here, have a sip, guess what's inside. Um, but it's still, it's still pretty gory. Still pretty gory. When I was doing campus ministry, um, one semester I taught through the book of Leviticus. And Leviticus is a book in the Old Testament that gives instructions for the, the sacrificial system that God set up with his people. And it's full of blood. And the reason I taught through it was because at the time, the comedian Nick Offerman was doing a, a stand-up tour, and he, during his stand-up, he would pull out a Bible, and he would flip to Leviticus, and he would read from it, and he would joke about it and laugh at it, because he said, this book, if taken seriously, is dangerous, so we must make fun of it. And I, I wanted to give college students a grounding in the one book of the Bible I knew they hadn't read all the way through. And so we studied Leviticus, Leviticus together, and so we spent a semester talking about the sacrificial system and all the sacrifices, and there, were, there was lots of blood. And I remember sitting down to coffee with this sweet southern girl who had a double name, and she said, <laughs> I really don't like this sermon series. She said, there's too much blood. There's too much blood sacrifice. And I had another student tell me, she said, you know, John, if you really want to get college students to come to your Bible study, you should talk about something less gross. The Bible talks about blood sacrifice, and this is a legitimate stumbling block to lots of modern people. Blood and blood sacrifice, they're everywhere in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. Referring to the Old Testament, the writer of the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews said, indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. The Old Testament sacrificial system called for regular sacrifices by priests where the blood of an animal was shed on behalf of the people for the forgiveness of sins. And I know for lots of people, maybe some of you, the, the thought that God would require a sacrifice to satisfy the requirements, his requirements, it might seem terribly primitive. It seems dark or gory. I mean, do, do we really need a religion like this? Don't we need a religion that inspires love and morality? The shedding of blood brings up the opposite associations, violence and war. These are not positive life-affirming images. So why all the blood? Why all the blood in the Bible? Well, blood was an incredibly powerful symbol in the ancient world. Ray Kanata writes that it communicated at least three things to the ancients. First, blood shows us that something is broken. It shows us that something is broken. It shows us that something is wrong. We get this, right? If, if, if you skin your knee and you start bleeding, you know that something is wrong with you. You know that something's not right. And without blood as humans, without lifeblood, we, drive up, we dry up, right? We dry up, we turn to dust. So blood sacrifices were designed to show people what is wrong with us, that, that what is wrong with us is serious business. And if the spilling of blood indicates that something is wrong, then a blood offering shows us just how serious our sin is against God. It tells us something is broken, and then it tells us that somebody is guilty. And we know it. We know this, right? We use expressions that articulate this. We say things like, I don't want blood on my hands, right? Blood offerings, offerings demonstrate that we're complicit. We ourselves are guilty, we are not innocent bystanders in a world go wrong, but we contribute to what's wrong with the world, both through what we've done and through what we've left undone, both our sins of commission and our sins of omission. This is what the people of Israel were affirming when they came to the temple with their sacrifices. And we, we know this, right? You know this. We all know something of our own guilt. Uh, there's this great story about Arthur Conan Doyle who wrote Sherlock Holmes, and he was known for his practical jokes and apparently he took great pleasure in teasing his friends 
And so, um, especially those who are a little rough around the, the edges. And so as the story goes, one day he sent an unsigned telegram to each of his closest friends that simply said, all is discovered, flee at once. And most of his friends immediately left town. Right? All of us know this, right? All of us experience this strange persistence of guilt. We know deep down that the problems in the world aren't just out there, but they're in here. And this is why we spend so much time covering things up, not letting people in. I, this is why so many of our neighbors are constructing identities for themselves that seek to absolve themselves of this feeling of guilt. Every human feels the fear that if people truly knew me, they'd reject me. Right? We're scared of people knowing the thoughts that cross our minds, the selfishness of our hearts, the things we've done. Right? Blood tells us something is broken. It tells us that it's my fault. And third, it leaves a stain. Its ability to stain is a powerful symbol. And we get this, right? It's hard to get out of clothes. Ancient world, it was considered a contaminant. It made people unclean. And blood offerings tell us that we're stained by sin. The stain of our conscience is not easily removed. We know when we've failed, right? We bring it up again and again to ourselves, to those we love, we know that we're not the people that we wish we were. We know we're not the people that other people think that we are. We're complicit. We, we just can't shake it. As much as we try to ignore it, all of us have memories of our guilt, stains on our consciousness. Friends, all of this is the background of Jesus' words to you in Matthew 26. When he says, drink of this cup, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is telling us powerfully, that his blood alone can and will save you. He even hints at how it's going to happen. Notice what he says. He says his blood is going to be poured out for many. This is lang the language of substitution. The Greek preposition here means instead of or in the place of many. He's saying he's, his blood is going to pour out instead of yours. And the gift of forgiveness, this gift of forgiveness is shown to us in the bread and in the cup. Now, if you were a first century Jewish person at this meal, you would notice that something is missing. Think about the Passover meal. There's bread, there's a cup, there's actually four cups, which represent the four promises that God made to his people in Exodus chapter six. But the main course is the lamb. This is how God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. God sent a series of plagues on the Egyptians, and this last plague finally convinced Pharaoh to free the Hebrew people. This is in Exodus chapter 12. And in that plague, we're told God sent the destroyer, this, this angel of death, to pass over the land, and he struck down the firstborn of every household in Egypt. But the Hebrews, God's people, were told to have a feast the night before, to kill a lamb, and they were to smear the lamb's blood on the lintels, on the door frame of their door, and that God would come in the night, and then, and then he would hover over the doors where the blood was and prevent the angel of death, prevent the destroyer from entering in and killing the children. That's where the name Passover comes from, that God protected so that death passed over the house. That the only way to be saved was to take shelter under the blood. But here, in Matthew 26, the lamb isn't mentioned. This supper with Jesus was unlike any other Passover meal ever celebrated before. And this is because of who hosted the meal. At the beginning of John's gospel, in John chapter 1, we're introduced to John the Baptist, and he is a wild man. He's down by the river, and he's baptizing people, preparing them for the coming Messiah. So he's in the river, people are coming to him, and he's giving them this baptism of repentance, this baptism of preparation, preparing for this king, this coming Messiah, who's going to liberate, to rescue Israel. And one day, we're told, he's baptizing, and he sees Jesus walking by, and he yells, he yells, behold, look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He's telling them, Jesus is the Lamb. Jesus is the Passover Lamb. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. When Jesus tells his disciples, my blood is going to pour, be poured out for your forgiveness, he's telling them, I will be slain so that you don't have to be. Y'all, we know this blood stains, but Jesus' blood washes away the stain of sin, so much so that the Bible can describe forgiven sinners as being washed whiter than snow. That is the gift of forgiveness. 
So how about our response? Henry David Thoreau said, the price of anything is the amount of life that you would exchange for it. Jesus gave his life for you, his whole life, all of it because of how valuable you are to him. So what's the right response to this gift? First, I want to quickly name two, I would say, the wrong responses to this gift. Ignoring the forgiveness or taking it for granted. Touch on these briefly. First, ignoring his forgiveness. Um, last year, I read a book about the first English expedition up the Nile River where they were trying to find the head of the Nile. And in that book, it talked about one of the explorers um, one night in his tent. This huge, huge storm picks up and it knocks down his tent and so this explorer, he lights a candle, he sets his tent back up together, and then all of a sudden, this, this horde of hundreds of beetles descends on him and fill his tent, and he's flailing, he's just trying to get rid of these beetles, and finally he gives up. He tries to ignore the beetles, he lies down, tries to go to sleep, and then one of the beetles crawls in his ear. And it burrows deeper and deeper, it drives him crazy, and he tries to get it out, he tries to use butter to get it out. He tries to use oil to get out, and finally he gets out his pen knife, and he digs out the beetle, and he kills the beetle, but he permanently deafens himself. All right, why in the world am I telling you that story? <laughs> Maybe you've been in the church for a long time, and you felt this pull to receive this gift of forgiveness from Jesus, but you've just ignored it. Here's the reality of your sin. It's like this horde of beetles, and if you ignore it, the best you can hope for is that it will only ruin your life and not the lives of everyone you love. Just fall asleep and let sin and its effects bury deep into your heart and your life. And if you do try to fix your sin on your own and dig your sin out with your own devices, it's going to do irreparable damage to you and those who you love the most. This is what happens when you ignore your sin and you ignore the gift of God's forgiveness to you in Christ. The second wrong response is when we take it for granted. Ken Sandy in his book, Peacemakers, wrote, when we take God's for forgiveness for granted, when we stubbornly withhold our forgiveness from others. In effect, we behave as though other sins are more serious than our sins against God. So how do you know if you're taking Christ's forgiveness for granted? Take an inventory of your relationships. Do you withhold forgiveness from others? Do other people experience God's grace from you? Does the forgiveness of God flow from Christ into you, into your heart, and overflow into the lives of others? Or do you stubbornly withhold forgiveness from others? Look at the action in this passage. Look with me at verse 26 through 29. Look down with me. What is, who's doing the work here? It's Jesus. Jesus took, Jesus blessed, Jesus broke, Jesus gave, Jesus said. It's Jesus who initiates with you, Jesus who blesses, Jesus who gives himself to you. His grace flows downhill to you so that it can flow through you. The right response to the gift of forgiveness is to receive it and to let it flow through you to your neighbors, whoever they may be. John Patton was a missionary in the 19th century in the New Hebrides, which are islands in the South Pacific. And he was a missionary to this tribe of cannibals. And they tried to kill him and eat him numerous times, and yet he survived. And after years of patient, faithful witness, many of the tribe came to Christ. This is how he describes their first communion. Listen to this. He says, for, ye for years we toiled and prayed and taught for this. At the moment when I put the bread and wine into those dark hands, once stained with the blood of cannibalism, but now stretched out to receive and partake the emblems and seals of the Redeemer's love, I had a foretaste of the joy of glory that well nigh broke my heart to pieces. I shall never taste a deeper blessing till I gaze on the glorified face of Jesus himself. Friends, you and I, we are no different than these former cannibals of the New Hebrides. We're sinners who deserve divine judgment, yet all of us find forgiveness when we come to Jesus spiritually hungry and thirsty. Don't ignore it. Don't take it for granted. Receive this gift. Think with me back to that first Passover meal that was celebrated in Egypt. Who was saved? Who was forgiven? Was, was it the people who did lots of good things? Was it those who promised to clean up their act? Was it those who had turned their lives around? Or was it the people who went to church every week? People who gave their money? Or was it the kids who obeyed their parents and did the right thing? 
No. It was the people who put the blood on their door. It was the people who trusted in the blood of another. Hear Jesus say to you this morning, perhaps for the first time, trust me. Trust my blood. Trust my sacrifice for your sins. Jesus ends this passage by saying, I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. All of this, all of this, the supper, the church, the word, all of it is because Jesus wants to bring you home to his Father. So what does it look like to respond to this gift of forgiveness? I'll close with this. About 12 years ago, the Colombian government hired an ad agency to help dismantle the rebel forces in the country of Colombia. Um, the rebel forces, the revolutionary armed forces of Colombia. And this ad agency, their work, was to create an ad campaign in the Colombian jungle, and it led to hundreds of these guerrilla, these rebel soldiers defecting, and to the first real peace talks in 50 years. And so this ad agency did three different campaigns, all at Christmas time where they decorated the jungle, they decorated the worn paths that the soldiers walked, the rivers they traversed, decorated the jungles and Christmas lights and memories of home, saying to these soldiers, don't you want to be home with your family for Christmas? So in 2012, real peace talks began, and still there were rebels who were out in the jungles, people who had still not yet returned home. And so for their final campaign, this ad agency realized that these rebels, they weren't coming home because they were scared. They were scared of being rejected by their families. They were haunted by this question at the, that at the end of the war, will they take me in again? Will my own family accept me back or will, will they reject me forever for what I've done? And so the final campaign they did was called Mother's Voices. And they found 37 mothers of rebel fighters who were willing to give them pictures of their, their sons when they were children. And the ad agency said that it was important that they give us pictures of the kids when they were really small. Because in order to protect them, to protect their identities, they needed to make sure that only the person in the picture would be able to recognize themselves. So they printed up these posters with pictures of these children, and underneath the picture it was written, before you were a gorilla, before you were a rebel, you were my child. Come home this Christmas. I'm waiting for you. So they printed up thousands of these posters, they hung them in the towns that the rebels moved through. They nailed them to the trees of the jungle. And the men who came home that Christmas, they didn't come home because they knew they were bad. They came home because they knew they were forgiven. So how do you respond to this gift of forgiveness? Look at Jesus, crucified and risen for you, and hear his voice. Before you were a rebel, before you were cursed, you were my child. Come home. All is forgiven. I'm waiting for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you that you are a God who desires to gather your children in, to wash us clean in the blood of your son so that you can gather us to your table and feast with you forever. Father, would you give us faith this morning to believe this and to have this hope that is ours in Christ, who is crucified and raised for us. We pray in his name. Amen. Thank you, John. I want to invite all of us, maybe some of us even for the first time, to come and to look to Jesus, to rest in his work on our behalf. Here in this time of confession, it's beautiful because we don't have to ignore our sin or act like everything's okay. We can confront it. We can examine it with great hope that Jesus' blood is enough, that he can wash away the darkest stain in our hearts and our lives. And we can rest in that. So I want to invite you together with me to confess your sin before the Father, and then we'll spend a few moments in private confession. Would you confess with me now? Our good Father, we confess that we have stayed too long in the far country and refused to come home. Rather than running into your outstretched arms, we have closed our hearts and wallowed in our shame. Grant us faith to see your smile that is ours in Christ 
and to collapse into your strong arms. Thank you that you delight to receive us into your embrace, fully washed in the blood of your son, Jesus. Amen. Please take a moment now and silently confess your sins to the Lord. Take your doubt, pour it out at his feet. You can bring your fear, your honest tears, your unbelief. When the burdens that you carry are more than you can bear, say this prayer.
you have indeed confessed your sins before the Lord this morning, receive and hold this sweet assurance tightly. This is for you, the children of God. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Take that peace that you've received from Christ and share it with one another. I want to invite you to take your seats as we continue with our worship this morning. Um, we now come to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And if you did not receive the elements, the little prepackaged elements when you came in, if you would raise your hand, and we have ushers who would love uh, to give those to you. Raise your hand high if you need um, communion elements. Um, so th- I guess my sermon was a, was a total, was just complete introduction to what we're about to do. Um, this gift that the Lord gives us to assure us of our, the forgiveness of our sins. And so the requirement to come to this table is to be hungry and thirsty because he feeds us with bread and cup so that we would know deep within us his love for us and his forgiveness of our sins. Um, if that doesn't describe you this morning, if you don't yet know Jesus in this way, we're so glad that you're here. But the invitation to you is that you would come to Jesus and no one who has given his life for you to forgive you of your sins. But if you do know Jesus and you, you do belong to his church, even if your faith, even if you're just holding on by a thread, know that he welcomes you and he invites you and he actually commands you to come to this table that you would eat and drink and be assured of his forgiveness for you. I'm gonna say the words of institution and then I'll lead us through taking the elements individually. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus was having dinner with his friends He took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. He said, this is my body which is given for you. In the same manner, after the supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he'll come again. Children of God, this is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. And this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you because he loves you. Take and drink. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you that you feed us on the body and blood of your son Jesus because you love us. Thank you that it symbolizes to us the forgiveness of our sins. And Lord, we pray that by the power of your spirit you would cause the joy and hope and peace, and love of knowing that we belong to you, to overflow of our hearts, and to permeate every relationship in our lives. Lord, send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and to work to your praise and glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Um, before we stand for the doxology, just want to draw your attention to a couple of announcements. First, if you were visiting with us this morning for the first time, we're so glad that you're here. And if you would like to get deeper connected into the life of our church, everything you need to know is on the back of the bulletin. And also, um, there are folks at the info desk. They'd love to meet you and help you figure out your next step um, in being part of what God's doing here at West End. 
Um, I want to draw your attention to a couple of announcements. First, as we enter into Holy Week, uh, we have a lot of offerings, of worship offerings, so that together we can enter into the story of Jesus as we anticipate Easter morning. Um, there's two of these that require registration. The first is Maundy Thursday. That's this Thursday night. We're having the service at 5.30 and then dinner at 6.30. If you'd like to join us for dinner, please register. You can do it through the Church Center app or on the website. Um, we need you to do that today, I think. And also, there's child care on Friday night for the Good Friday service at 5.30. You register for child care there as well. Um, also, uh, after Holy Week, as we've been talking about through the season of Lent, we're going to do a three-week series on Hope Explored on Wednesday nights here. Um, I believe it's at 6.30 upstairs. And this Hope Explored is a introduction into the Christian hope. It's, it's designed to be accessible to people with no Christian background who are interested in hearing the hope that's available and that's an offer in Jesus. And so the people that you've been praying for this season encourage you to invite them to this. Um, it's going to be three weeks. There's more information on the, web st- on the, on the website. Um, one more thing. Um, so as, as we know, this Wednesday is the one year anniversary of the tragic shooting at the Covenant School. And um, as a community, you know, this, this touches so many in our community. And um, we're going to be praying. I invite you to continue to pray uh, for the Covenant School and those connected this week. On Wednesday, we're going to have a service at noon um, that will be space to come and to grieve with hope together. And as always, our care team is available for you if you have any needs this week. We would love to care for you Um, because I know so many of us carry this, we carry it in our hearts, we carry it in our bodies, just um, the pain of this, Um, but we grieve with hope, because we serve serve a Savior um, who was crucified and risen for us. Um, Finally, um, I want to invite Carter Crenshaw up. Um, You all know Carter? Carter's our founding pastor, Um, and it's been a year uh, since the transition, and um, uh, Carter is, continues to serve at Weston in the role of founding pastor, and so he is freed up to spend his time ha- meeting with people one-on-one, leading small groups, and he is the speaker at the men's retreat. So that information, men, um, sign up for that. It's the f- second weekend in April, um, and Carter is going to be uh, speaking there. And um, Carter, we love you. Um, we're so grateful for you. It's been such a privilege to continue to... Um, to work in, in these fields that you have been so faithfully laboring in for 25 years and so grateful for you. Um, after we sing the doxology, would you say the benediction over us? Thank you. I invite you now to stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. I want to remind you about Pastor Jack. He'll be in the back to pray for you if you need any sort of prayer. He's a wonderful guy, so please go and see him. Would you receive the benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace forever and ever and ever. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you.